stick to your guns. Uh, how are you today? I'm pretty good. Yeah. Had a decent night's sleep. Got to the venue. It's a beautiful day here in Pittsburgh. And uh, just got some exercise in. So, you know, ready for that overnight drive tonight. Oh, gee, where's the next show? Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay. So I think it's going to probably take us about seven hours okay. to stop. So it's kind of like too much of a drive to do during right. the day. So we usually pull those up. Right. You guys, uh, where was your last show? Allentown? No, like around our there, last or New show Jersey. Was in Sawyerville, New Jersey. Okay. Yesterday we had a day off in Allentown. Okay, and you went to the WWE. We did. We went to SmackDown. Yeah. What was that like? It was great. It was great. Um, uh, Becky Lynch was wrestling. Um, sometimes her and I work out okay. at home. And then uh, Cesaro was also wrestling, and, and him and I know each other as well. So it was really cool to go there. And both of them were wrestling last night. And, uh, they hooked us up with ringside seats, which was super sweet. And um, our guitar tech had never been to a wrestling event. Oh, really? So he was fucking losing his mind. And so it was me, our drummer George, guitar player Chris, and then our, our tech as well. So, okay. uh, yeah, it was a blast. Cool, cool. Um, so you guys are out here with uh, Parkway Drive. Yep. Um, often tour mates. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, I've toured with them quite a bit. Uh, my old band, Evergreen Terrace, cool. did did a decent amount towards them. But um, Sit Your Guns just did a tour with them in Europe last year. So it's kind of... We did last year in Europe, we did Architects, Parkway Drive, right. and then a headliner. And then this year in America, we did Architects, Parkway Drive, and we'll be doing a headliner later on in the year, most nice. likely. Okay. But, yeah, we haven't announced that cool. yet, so I shouldn't tell you that. I, I know nothing. Um... So speaking of you know doing summers, doing festivals and stuff like that, the season obviously is upon us. We're outside today. Yep. Um, you just did a festival down in Carolina, mm -hmm. Carolina Rebellion. Yep. Um, Allison Chains played, right? Yeah. What was that like? It was really cool, actually. For Carolina Rebellion, we got there um, way too early, yeah. and Allison Chains was sound checking. Yeah. So that was sweet. To be like, oh fuck yeah! Just, just no crowd. Just, yeah. And it was cool that they were actually sound checking the mm -hmm. shit, which I think is unique for a band of that. Of that caliber, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the weekend before, we also did uh, a festival in Jacksonville, Florida called Welcome to Rockville. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of the same bands. This weekend we do in Somerset, Wisconsin, which is called Northern Invasion, and the following weekend we do Rock on the Range. And yeah. so it kind of seems to be a two to three day festivals um, with the same kind of group of bands. Sure, So it's sure. cool. It's like, oh, sweet, I'm going to watch Alice in Chains four times. You know, nice. this, this month, I get to watch Andrew WK four times yeah. this month, you know, so, uh, it's cool. How was the pizza guitar? You, uh, you know what? <laughs> what sucked is I wanted to see the pizza guitar so bad, and then after we got done playing, we were like, let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. So, we just left, and, uh, but this weekend, I'll, uh, I'll You'll see it. You'll catch them. Um, do you like festivals here in America more than Europe, or vice versa? I'm biased because we do so many more festivals in Europe sure. that it seems more familiar. And I think that Europe has such a, um, I guess really like a thankfulness for festivals. Yeah. And there's there's a true festival season over there. Yes. And and I think that that's, that's really part of their culture where I don't think that's ever been something that's really been ingrained in American culture. I mean, obviously you do have massive festivals like Coachella and shit like that, which is which is really cool, but um, I don't think that like a true festival season has happened yet in America for band for heavier bands. Yeah. And um, and so that's what's been really cool about about this tour is exploring that. And again, this tour, these festivals that we're doing, we're still out of the box on them because it is Godsmack, it is Alice in Chains, it is Avenged Sevenfold. Um, it is a lot more of the rock radio crowd, sure. which is cool for us because we like to we like the challenge, you know. But um, I, I would have to say Europe, just because when you go over there and play a festival in Europe for twenty thousand people, they're like fucking pumped, yeah. Whether they know your band or not, and it's just a really cool thing. And it's and you know for a band like us, one night we'll play a club for two hundred people, and the next night we'll play a festival for twenty thousand. And, and you know, there's that there's that crazy all in between so it's very it's it's and it's very uh seldom that we do play those huge festivals so sure. when we do we are very appreciative yeah that hasn't happened yet in America for us so speaking of all, all of that then how do you feel about you know mayhem's gone now warp tour is going to be gone mm -hmm. um being you know uh, a graduate of the warp tour scene um 
How do you feel about that? Like it's going away? Um, I think that there's definitely a time for everything to go away. And I think that it's time for Warp Tour to kind of step aside. But I do think that there's a part that's like kind of sad because even from when I was a kid going to Warp Tour 96, 97, 98, it was that was the big thing that I look forward to every summer. So it's kind of a bummer that that's leaving and that that might, um, it, that was such an easy way for kids to get into alternative underground music. And so I wonder what's going to take its place now because. You know, there's not even, you know, at, towards the end of MTV, they started putting bands from our genre mm -hmm. on there. And there was, um, there was a lot more of, like, ways for the underground to kind of seep into people's minds. But you take away Warp Tour and you take away things like MTV, I kind of wonder what is going to happen to it. Um, yeah. And not that that's a bad thing, it's just an unknown thing, you know. But uh, I think that Warp Tour was... Um, definitely uh, a really cool um, experience that happened for over 20 years and I was stoked that you know I got to do it multiple times and and I loved it and hated doing it you know sure. it was kind of like prison mixed with summer camp you know so yeah but uh but at the end of the day you know it's it, it always we did work for our last summer and we had a fucking blast on it so um I'm glad that we did get to do it last yeah. summer. cool um Kind of changing gears. Um, True View has been out for what about nine yeah, months, sure something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, a um, little bit of a change, I think, from uh, the EP before it, and of course, Diamond. Mm -hmm. um, is that mainly because of the direction that Jesse went into? No, um, no, because Jesse, for most of the records, the lyrics and melodies and vocal patterns aren't done until we're in the studio okay um so this record predominantly chris and i had worked on um just throughout you know the last year and a half or whatever mm -hmm. and, and, we, and we came in with i don't know there was probably 20 songs for us to pick from and then um songs like 56 and forgiveness of self were written in the studio with the producer derek hoffman um I think that it was just kind of a natural progression for us. There wasn't, there was never a conversation of, okay, this record needs to sound like this, or needs to be more like this, or more like that. Um, we did want to explore a little bit more with going outside of the box with a couple of songs like 56 and like Forgiveness of Self that are a little bit more structured kind of rock songs. Um, we did that with disobedient a little bit mm -hmm. with a song The Crown and the, the last track on the record Left You Behind and uh, we were shocked that a lot of fans would always ask us to play Left You Behind and we're like really? Like that's not heavy right. it's kind of a ballad you know <laughs> what I mean it's kind of like an, just an emotional ballad song and so we kind of wanted to explore that a little bit and with the producer Derek um, he had great like pop rock writing skills and sensibilities and, and I think that's where his background really really is so we kind of took advantage of that but as far as everything else goes I think it was just something that was just organic yeah organic sure theory. sure yeah. Um, I, I wish it was something more <laughs> I no like but I mean that's it, but. yeah but I mean you, you're progressing as a band yeah absolutely. continually absolutely right? um, I don't think I don't think that we're a band that can continually write the same record and the same right. songs and get away with it where there are bands like Pennywise and Hatebreed who can put out the same record over and over and over and every time it's fucking awesome sure for us sure. it wouldn't be fucking awesome right. for us gotcha. it would just be like ah this is boring now <laughs> so we have to kind of inject some stuff uh, you know every once in a while and also for us as well like as songwriters and as, as performers really we want to try different stuff mm -hmm. so but we also understand there's a balance of trying too much and then right. alienating everyone who ever liked our band. And then right. also, because like, you know, tonight we'll play Forgiveness of Self. And I like listening to the song. I don't really like playing the song. You know? <laughs> right. I want to play Nobody or Something to the Truth or like songs that I see people want to smash their Yeah, into sure. Floor. But at the same time, it's cool to change up the dynamic of the, of the life. Show as well. But I do like the song. I, I really like the video. The imagery I love the video. is awesome. Yeah, and I think that 
the really the cool thing about that song is and that type of song I feel like in the future for anything else that we write like that that's one thing that I've noticed is that it's so much easier to create really fucking cool imagery to that video wise than it is it's almost like ah! Yeah, right. You know, where same. the director's like, everything's going to cut really fast. You have to feel yeah. like you're on you know, a roller coaster and having anxiety. And that's, that's whenever we saw the video for Forgiveness of Self, I was like, this is fucking cool. Like, this is a video I'd be like, hey, Dad, check this out. You know? <laughs> and he'd be like, oh, you're not a piece of shit after all. So, yeah. <laughs> Did you have any input in that imagery, or was it kind of just the director just kind of no, took it over? Was, and... Yeah, it, and it was funny because uh, we had kind of loosely talked about doing a video for it. And Jesse said that he had my had an idea for it, and the director is actually a friend that he went to high school with. Okay. And he's like, oh, my, my friend, uh, who he hasn't been married to the noise video, and which you know that was a video that we came up with a concept with, and and it didn't quite work out the way that we the idea of the video is everything was supposed to be in reverse, mm -hmm. but then we realized after we did it like, oh, it kind of just looks like we're just being kind of weird but it's a cool it's still a cool a cool video i think once you know that everything's in reverse then it is more like visually stimulating to look at but um we really liked working with the director and then jesse is into adam and jesse was like those two we're getting some stuff with adam him and i are spitballing ideas back and forth and then something happened where we decided to fly out i want to say it was like a last minute change to have a rehearsal which we very rarely do I think we're about to have a headliner and we decided to leave a little bit early and then Jesse was like, oh, I gotta shoot this video today with Adam. And then, we, you know, we're like, what? And then, yeah. you know, he's like, but no, he's like, we don't need the full band. And I'm glad that it was fucking awesome about being part of the video because sometimes video shoots are the pretty worst tedious. part about being in the band. Um, but then when we saw it, we're like, oh man, this is so fucking cool. So yeah, I think that's that's one of my favorites to do those videos. Cool. Um, you brought up Hate Breed. And you were on uh, Justice podcast yeah. recently. Yeah. Um, I've not listened to it. <laughs> you haven't. <laughs> I do not know. Well, uh, you might the, want to. <laughs> it's the third time that I've I've done it, and every time when I get done, um, I'll talk to my wife and she'll go, "How was it?" And I go, "Uh, I don't know." <laughs> Like, I don't know. I think I may have said some stuff, or he may have said some stuff that we shouldn't have said. And then I'm like, yeah, I don't know. And then, you know, people are like, oh, you know, we like it. It's cool. And I've only listened to, actually, I've, I've listened to the other two. I haven't listened to this one yet. So. It's, it's good. I don't want to spoil it for any listeners, but yeah. uh, the Kenny story uh, oh, okay, is good. beautiful. Okay, great. Absolutely hilarious. Great. And, so he um, didn't blur out his name. All right, that's I, good to know. Well, his full name's on there. Yeah. And uh, the charging the mound, starting it off, was oh, just that was too time, much. That was the part where, after after I left, uh, I was talking to my wife. She's, I was like, well, like, it really caught me off guard. And I go, and I thought charging the mound was something else. And then it was this, and I was like, yeah, of course I charged the mound. And then I was like, no, no, I didn't. I was like, fuck. That's hilarious. Um, so. I want to ask you a, a strange question. I, I, today I was on Instagram. I was looking at Gary Holt, you know, from Slayer, mm -hmm. showing his new guitars. Mm -hmm. And one of them, strangely enough, was a Prince guitar. It's really cool. Yeah, check it out. Um, but it's like Gary Holt, Slayer, you know, Exodus, influenced by Prince. Right. Uh, I've talked to Doyle from The Misfits many, many times. And I asked him one of his most influential uh, guitarists. And he's like Joe Perry from Aerosmith. I'm like, Joe Perry, yeah. Misfits. This just doesn't seem right. like... Um, are there any guitar players that have influenced you that people would be like, really? Um, I, I learned how to play guitar because of two records, which was Propagandi, How to Clean Everything. And I would say that Chris Hanna, the singer guitar player for that band, is one of my favorite guitar players. And um, Lagwagon trashed. Yeah. And we did a tour with Lagwagon a few years ago, and I was like, oh, I got it. I got to tell this. And so we were with Chris, the, the really tall guitar player who's also referred to as Big Bitch. Yep. And so we we're talking to him and I was like, hey, I was like, um, you know, whenever Live Wagon Trash came out, I was, you know, junior high or something and I heard it and, and uh, that's that's like, that influenced me like how, the way I play guitar. And I go, um, and he goes, oh, that sucks. 
And he goes, I'll learn how to play guitar because of Black Sabbath. That's a real band. And then I just oh, felt shit. dumb. I was like, oh, yeah, oh. yes, but what? Um, so I would say both of those bands really influenced me. Also, a guitar player that I love when I started learning how to play guitar. I mean, Queen is my all-time favorite rock band. But also, I, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, but I think it's Kim Tai, the guy from Soundgarden. Oh, yeah. I just thought that. Whether it's Ty or Thale or Kim yeah, Thale. Something yeah, Kim Thale, something like that. And I just remember thinking, like, this guy is so fucking cool, and I liked watching him play, and I liked how he played guitar. And, um, yeah, I think that those were the, the ones that really are big influences on me. But a guitar player that I actually get inspired by a lot is Chris, the other guitar player mm -hmm. for Stick to Your Guns. Um, when I joined Stick to Your Guns, it was when Diamond was being recorded. The record before that is The Hope Division, and that's when Chris, George, and Andrew all made yeah, their okay. debut on the record. And that's when Chris came on as a primary songwriter, and he has a very distinct style. And so when I joined Stick to Your Guns, that was different. The style is different from bands like Evergreen Terrace or Casey Jones or One Fifth or other bands that I've been a part of. So now when I write for Stick to Your Guns, there is a part of me that goes like, what would I do? But there's also a big part of me that goes, what would Chris do? And so like when I wrote, um, I wrote The Sun, The Moon, The Truth, there was a couple parts in that where I was like, how do I make this sound like something Stick to Your Guns would do? Mm -hmm. But when I think of that, I think of how would I make this sound like something Chris Rawson would kind of would kind of write. So it's it's cool and it's weird to like be in a band that's like, hey man, I'm trying to write stuff like like you. Um, but then it's also cool for me as a songwriter to try to. It's I don't even actually want to say it's cool. It's kind of a struggle in my head sometimes because I'm trying to write something that is someone else's complete sound and I think I've by now through Disobedient and through the EP and, and through True View I've kind of added a little bit to mm -hmm. it you know but it's still like I'm trying to write for Stick to Your Guns instead of like trying to write for my band right um, so that is that's something that every time I sit down to write a song for Stick to Your Guns it's, it's kind of a struggle for but but he is a big inspiration because I think one thing about Chris, one really cool thing about Chris is um, is he is always trying to think outside of the box. And sometimes it's too much outside the box. He was like, I'm going to scrape the pick up the, the bridge and then I'm going to hit this harmonic above the nut. And then, you know what I mean? I was Christian. And they're like, all right, well, it just sounds like you're kind of hitting an open string. But, you know, but then other times he writes stuff. I'm like, oh, man, that's so fucking cool. It's such a cool idea. So that was a big thing. And then, um, and also another thing is I, I recently, last year I joined the band's 18 Visions came back yeah. and, and so now I play guitar in 18 Visions and I had to learn all their old songs from you know like 1998 right. 1999 and those songs are written like so ridiculous like it makes no sense like you can tell some young guy was like check this out yeah blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know but that has been a, a like kind of an inspiration for me too to think outside of the box when now I'm writing songs to kind of like go like Oh, like I would never play something like this, but maybe I can try to write something like this. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm glad you're back in Pittsburgh. Yep, Good too. to see you again. You get to play Stage AE tonight, which uh, I don't think you guys have played no, before. No. Um, amazing venue. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on your marriage. Thank you very and much. And becoming an uncle. Yes, thank looks, you. Looks like life is uh, is yeah, going pretty pretty good for you. I can't so complain. so thanks again. Very good to see you again. Appreciate it. Yes, yeah, thank you.